Hi, I am Regina King, director of One Night in Miami, and I am joined today with the amazing cast of One Night in Miami. Kingsley Benadire, Eli Gore, Aldis Hodge, and Leslie Odom Jr. And IMDb has brought us here together to talk about representation in cinema and television uh, and what it feels like to see ourselves or not see ourselves. <laughs> so here we go. For me, you know, you, we really didn't have much in film or TV that really had anyone that looked like me. You know, maybe, you know, Cooley High, but the main characters were men. You just never really got to see girls, uh, black girls as like the lead in something. Black girls just aren't the leads, still to this day, you know. For me, um, there was a film that Maya Angelou wrote called Sister, Sister that had Irene Cara, Diane Carroll, and Rosalind Cash that totally moved me because I just, I had never seen black women interacting honestly and not being the token woman in the story, black woman in the story, you know? I'm tired of living with lies about how, how good Papa was and how good his life was and how good this, Dad. Seeing them love on each other, argue, um, it was very powerful. And Rosalind Cash was just, just everything to me. She was just so real, God rest her soul. This made me realize, oh wow, okay, we can be actresses with different levels to it than not playing the same role. That, that film was special for me and my sister. You have your way and I have mine. Got that right. You know, mine is probably, um, I mean, it's complicated because the legacy of, the legacy of this work in light of the man who created it, it's like it's all tied up and stuff now, you know, but mine was the Cosby Show and what, what Bill created there and, and what he created with A Different World, you know, was very impactful. Regardless of your degree, I am telling you, they will think you know less than you do because you're black. It's not enough for you to be equal. You have to be better. It did feel aspirational, you know, the, the image of this very, very upper middle class black family. It was very manicured and it was very, because we were fighting a different kind of narrative, you know, that they were, the, those works were being created in opposition of, of certain awful, um, images out there about who we were as people but we're, we're past that time now and so we don't need a cosby show for today that's exactly how i feel i feel like there was a i think 2002 2003 something was happening just uh, i was 16 there's this bbc drama called out of control that really stuck with me and, and resonated in a huge way. You're a liar, you're a thief, and you're a junkie. Uh, why don't you invite me around for Shut dinner? Shut up. I'll, I'll apologize. I'll make it good You spent all work. your life apologizing. I was just glued because they were filming in Queen's Crescent, where I'm from in Kentish Town. The whole urban setting was like literally my neighborhood. And the characters were just people who I'd grown up with and like, the main character was this young guy who ends up getting in trouble in his neighborhood, but he's a really sweet soul. And this thing blew my mind. I, I went into school the next day and I was like, boys, boys, did you see that thing? Did you see that thing? And everyone had seen it. That was the, my first experience of really going like, wow, that's like where I'm from, you know, being shown. Why am I making such a big deal? It's a massive big deal because he's a little thug. I don't want you near him. I grew up in the business, so I kind of saw myself, literally myself. I saw myself like on Sesame Street, you know. <laughs> Everybody say hola, hola. And I was like, ah, this is me. So it's kind of like normal, you know what I'm saying? But I think the first time I saw a performance where it sort of opened my eyes up and I was like, oh, wow, like, you know, I want to do a role like that. I think it was Don Cheadle playing Mouse and Devil in a Blue Dress. You think you're going to have trouble with that dude, Frank? I can just run by and kill him and take that evening train to Houston. Nah, Mouse. He was suave, but a little off the hinges, and it was such an interesting character. 
and also such a sort of a great compliment to Denzel Washington's character as well. You gonna do everything I say? Man, I'm gonna do everything you say. That's the wrong hand, Mom. Oh. It's just the way he played it. I said, I wanna do something interesting like that when I grow up. And, you know, of course, over the years, you see less and less of yourself on screen. So it just drove me hard. It motivated me more to maintain and stay in this business, not even for me to get more jobs, it's to open up more opportunities. So, you know, seeing myself becomes normal. Hey man, look, if you need somebody to run them streets with you again, just give me a call. Uh, mine was also uh, a Denzel related film. Uh, my mom took me to see uh, Malcolm X when I was very, very young. We didn't land on Plymouth Rock. Plymouth Rock landed on us. And then at the end when they had the, you know, I am Malcolm X, I am Malcolm X with all the little kids. It connected with me and I'd never had that experience. Hey, yo, Eli, yeah. Eli, yeah. you know, me and my brother were extras in Malcolm X. Get out of here, bro. So we were probably those little kids. <laughs> I was so what, you're saying, what you're saying is I inspired you <laughs> from all those years ago. For real, for real. Yeah, man, it's crazy. It's still my favorite film to this day, just because it meant so much to me at that moment. I wouldn't tell you this if I didn't love you. Yeah. No, you wouldn't. Those early Spike Lee films, those early John Singleton films. Of course, Boys in the Hood, which Regina was in, which is so crazy. <laughs> those films made me really know what it was to be a black man. Like really to know what it is to be black and to be masculine and to be articulate and to be artistic and to be creative and to be celebrated and, and to be cool. You know, Denzel made a black man cool, you know? And uh, to make this film, it was amazing to be a part of a film that I think is of that same essence that'll affect another generation the way that film and those films affected me. It's, it's It kind of gives you chills and it makes you just feel like very grateful um, and very blessed. You know, the idea of tradition and generational um, blessings is, is powerful. This movement that we are in is called a struggle because we are fighting for our lives. On the subject of like representation behind the camera in, in film and TV, my experience of, of, of filming in the States and going into a, a make, hair and makeup department for the first time, and there's just people in there who understand how to cut my hair and how to put makeup on my skin was something that I'm only experiencing for the first time, like in the last year or two, you know? and. The first eight years of my sort of professional career in the UK, it just doesn't exist. And it's a real anxiety going in every time I set foot on a, you know, on set in this country. It's just not, it's something that we still haven't worked out and how it's not accepted that there is, you know, a difference in hair texture and how, like, you, you, unless you're cutting my hair all the time, you just really have no business doing it. So. It's really important and I remember being really, really moved. But like I remember going into that truck for the first time and just being stunned and I felt the sense of relaxation that that gave me to like when I came on set to play, it was a game changer. And Wayne and the department that we had on this movie, I, I like, it really made me, it makes me emotional and I'm so grateful to have Wayne every day. Just like, just one thing not to worry about, someone messing with my hair. So, like, <laughs> It's really, it's really important, you know, it's really important. Like Kingsley was saying, yes, it is polarizing. When you step into a hair and makeup trailer, I've been fighting this fight for a long time. I've been working with my barber for like 12 years. He just got in the union this year. It's been, we've been hustling that long to get him in the union. When you're trained as a cosmetologist, you're not required to be trained on certain different ethnic hairstyles, black hair. So you go on there and they throw a bunch of gels and mousses at you and you sitting there looking messed up. It's a couple of jobs I'll never watch because I look busted, <laughs> you know? Yeah, it's, you know, it, it can, you know, sound, I love what you're saying, but you know? I, I love that Kingsley went there too. There was yeah. a big movement at one of the studios about that recently and a bunch of women spoke to it. They said, you have to understand yeah. how we start our day. Yeah. That's, you know, so right from the beginning, I don't feel welcome. I used to, the, the same thing, you know, all my all my white brothers and sisters would get made up, get their hair and makeup done at work. Yeah. I, I would have to, 
even on long shoot days and stuff, I would have to go to the barber shop, you know, the night before at 11 p.m. or if I could get my barber to, because they wouldn't even let my barber oh. in the hair and makeup trailer. Can't tell you how many times I wanted to reach out and punch somebody. Then, but then, you... then, then, strike with the weapon that you have, man, your voice. Every underserved population always needs allies. Kemp first with the script. You know, I felt that he wanted to do something daring. For reasons that we all understand, there has been careful consideration, even when we're telling our own stories, about how much truth we're willing to tell and how much truth we're willing to show. Because um, we don't want to be further maligned. We know that so few of us get through the door that you know, we don't want to make it harder for those of us after to get through the door for many reasons. And so to have Kemp write this script, to have Regina at the helm, our job was only between action and cut to be as fearless as brother Malcolm, you know, as bold as Sam, Cassius or Jim. Everything's not so black and white like you make it out to be. I'd love to uh, chime in on that as far as is it important to have us represented behind the scenes, it absolutely is, because what I don't understand, and I've spoken on this many times, is how do you plan to tell an accurate story that involves representing a culture with nobody behind the scenes that has the experience of said culture, right? What I've come to learn over the last uh, year especially is that when there is a cultural shift towards the attention of us, what people sometimes often do, and, and I feel like they commercialize the black experience by commoditizing black pain. But you have to put the right people in the right positions to tell that story, because for us, it's not a trend. We live with the consequences of said work. So it is a calculated decision. And whenever it comes to what we're doing, oftentimes I do see the trend of people saying, well, you know what, this is, you know, this is hot right now. Black people are not a trend. And if you want to make money by displaying our stories, you want to make money off of us, you have to make money with us. You know who gets paid more than the writer of a song that hits number 94 on the Billboard Hot 100? Mm. The writer of a song that hits number one. Sam, in that speech that Kemp wrote, Sam is speaking about the power of owning all of his, um, all of his music. He did that, that without him doing that, a Ray Charles wouldn't have done that. So that's just a, an immediate example of the necessity to, uh, in, in Malcolm's case, sometimes you gotta burn it all down and we gotta start from scratch. And, and sometimes it's about uh, uh, approaching it from an economic standpoint. It's all situational, you know, it depends on the situation, which one you apply, both of them, uh, exists. You know, I've been approached about, hey, you want to work on this? Okay, cool. What are you doing? Telling a black story. Great. You want to produce it? Great. Um, your executive board is all Caucasian. Your writer's Caucasian. My first producerial decision is for you to get a black writer. And most people say no. But my question is why? If you want to get a consultant for crime, if you're writing a crime story, you want to get a consultant for law, if you're writing a law story, why not have black people in the right positions? Because it's not about Xing everybody out. There, there's cohesion and there's room for everybody at play. But when you want to write a story that's about black people led by black people, you have to put the right black people in the right positions to make that story sing. Hence the result of One Night in Miami, having the right people in the right positions. Give him an autograph, Jim. Actually, Mr. Cook. <laughs> oh. Sure thing, brother. Someone asked me the other day, was it important that our director was black? Absolutely. Why? Because not only just black, but the right person, Regina, being who she is, knowing her experience. When we want to shift maybe a story point, a line even, to get to a certain place, because she understands what we're trying to do and the cause and effect and what we're trying to answer, what issue we're trying to solve within the community and what we're trying to explain because she knows that we can go there. It's hard trying to explain that to somebody who doesn't understand and wants to make a creative decision that actually would harm the community because they don't realize the consequences because they don't have to live in the consequences. I think all of us here on this uh, phone, and on this phone, <laughs> on this um, uh, uh, Zoom, uh, we all um, find ourselves always in certain situations 
uh, uh, deciding how um, elegant we are gonna be or how, you know, this is what it's gonna be. And that is, um, I guess, the good thing about where we are right now when we talk about how much hasn't changed. Uh, what has, I think, changed is that we have gotten to the place where we feel empowered uh, to really speak our minds right now and to not feel like we need to apologize for, uh, for, for, for how we feel. We want a world where we're safe to be ourselves. Yeah.